Chapter Two of *The Men in the Walls* by William Tin. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Two. The tribe had gathered in its central and largest burrow under the great hanging glow lamps that might be used in this place alone. Except for the few sentinels on duty in the outlying corridors, all of mankind was here. It was an awesome sight to behold. On the little hillock known as the Royal Mound lolled Franklin the father of many thieves, chieftain of all mankind. He alone of the cluster of warriors displayed heaviness of belly and flabbiness of arm, for he alone had the privilege of a sedentary life. Beside the sternly muscled band leaders who formed his immediate background, he looked almost womanly, and yet one of his many titles was simply The Man. Yes, unquestionably, the man of mankind was Franklin, the father of many thieves. You could tell it from the hushed, respectful attitudes of the subordinate warriors who stood at a distance from the mound. You could tell it from the rippling interest of the women as they stood on the other side of the great burrow, drawn up in the ranks of the female society. You could tell it from the nervousness and scorn with which the women were watched by their leader, Oteil, the chieftain's first wife. And finally you could tell it from the faces of the children, standing in a distant, disorganized bunch. A clear majority of their faces bore an unmistakable resemblance to Franklin's. Franklin clapped his hands, three evenly spaced, flesh-heavy wallops. "'In the name of our ancestors,' he said, "'and the science with which they ruled the earth, I declare this council opened. May it end as one more step in the regaining of their science. Who asked for a council?' "'I did.' Thomas the Trap Smasher moved out of his band and stood before the chief. Franklin nodded and went on with the next formal question. And your reason? As a band leader, I call attention to a candidate for manhood, a member of my band, a spear carrier for the required time, and an accepted apprentice in the male society. My nephew, Eric the Only. As his name was sung out, Eric shook himself. Half of his own volition and half in response to the pushes he received from the other warriors, he stumbled up to his uncle and faced the chief. This, the most important moment of his life, was proving almost too much for him. So many people in one place, accredited and famous warriors, knowledgeable and attractive women, the chief himself. All this after the shattering revelations from his uncle, he was finding it hard to think clearly. And it was vital to think clearly. His responses to the next few questions had to be exactly right. The chief was asking the first. Eric the Only, do you apply for full manhood? Eric breathed hard and nodded. I do. As a full man, what will be your value to mankind? I will steal for mankind whatever it needs. I will defend mankind against all outsiders. I will increase the possessions and knowledge of the female society, so that the female society can increase the power and well-being of mankind. And all this you swear to do? And all this I swear to do. The chief turned to Eric's uncle. As his sponsor, do you support his oath and swear that he is to be trusted? With just the faintest hint of sarcasm in his voice, Thomas the Trap Smasher replied, Yes, I support his oath and swear that he is to be trusted. There was a rattling moment, the barest second, when the chief's eyes locked with those of the band leader. With all that was on Eric's mind at the moment, he noticed it. Then the chief looked away and pointed to the women on the other side of the burrow. He is accepted as a candidate by the men. Now the women must ask for proof, for only a woman's proof bestows full manhood. 
The first part was over, and it hadn't been too bad. Eric turned to face the advancing leaders of the female society, Otiel, the chieftain's first wife, in the center. Now came the part that scared him, the women's part. As was customary at such a moment, his uncle and sponsor left him when the women came forward. Thomas the Trap Smasher led his band to the warriors grouped about the throne mound. There, with their colleagues, they folded their arms across their chests and turned to watch. A man can only give proof of his manhood while he is alone. His friends cannot support him once the women approach. It was not going to be easy, Eric realized. He had hoped that at least one of his uncle's wives would be among the three examiners. They were both kindly people who liked him and had talked to him much about the mysteries of women's work. But he had drawn a trio of hard-faced females, who apparently intended to take him over the full course before they passed him. Sarah, the sickness healer, opened the proceedings. She circled him belligerently, hands on hips, her great breasts rolling to and fro like a pair of swollen pendulums, her eyes glittering with scorn. "'Eric the Only,' she intoned, and then paused to grin, as if it were a name impossible to believe. "'Eric the Singleton. Eric the one and only child of either his mother or his father. <laughs> Your parents almost—' didn't have enough between them to make a solitary child. Is there enough in you to make a man?" There was a snigger of appreciation from the children in the distance, and it was echoed by a few growling laughs from the vicinity of the throne mound. Eric felt his face and neck go red. He would have fought any man to the death for remarks like these. Any man at all. But who could lift his hand to a woman and be allowed to live? Besides, one of the main purposes of this exhibition was to investigate his powers of self-control. "'I think so,' he managed to say after a long pause. "'And I'm willing to prove it.' "'Prove it, then,' the woman snarled. Her right hand, holding a long, sharp-pointed pin, shot to his chest like a flung spear. Eric made his muscles rigid and tried to send his mind away. That, the men had told him, was what you had to do at this moment. It was not you they were hurting, not you at all. You, your mind, your knowledge of self, were in another part of the burrow entirely, watching these painful things being done to someone else. The pen sank into his chest for a little distance, paused, came out. It probed here, probed there. Finally it found a nerve in his upper arm. There, guided by the knowledge of the sickness healer, it bit and clawed at the delicate area until Eric felt he would grind his teeth to powder in the effort not to cry out. His clenched fist twisted agonizingly at the end of his arms, in a paroxysm of protest. But he kept his body still. He didn't cry out. He didn't move away. He didn't raise a hand to protect himself. Sarah, the sickness healer, stepped back and considered him. "'There is no man here yet,' she said grudgingly. "'But perhaps there is the beginnings of one.' He could relax. The physical test was over. There would be another one, much later, after he had completed his theft successfully. But that would be exclusively by men as part of his proud initiation ceremony. Under the circumstances, he knew he would be able to go through it almost gaily. Meanwhile, the women's physical test was over. That was the important thing for now. In sheer reaction, his body gushed forth sweat which slid over the bloody cracks in his skin and stung viciously. He felt the water pouring down his back and forced himself not to go limp, prodded his mind into alertness. Did that hurt? He was being asked by Rita, the old crone of a record-keeper. There was a solicitous smile on her forty-year-old face, 
but he knew it was a fake. A woman as old as that no longer felt sorry for anybody. She had too many aches and pains and things generally wrong with her to worry about other people's troubles. A little, he said, not much. The monsters will hurt you much more if they catch you stealing from them. Do you know that? They will hurt you much more than we ever could. I know, but the stealing is more important than the risk I'm taking. The stealing is the most important thing a man can do. Rita, the record-keeper, nodded. Because you steal things mankind needs in order to live. You steal things that the female society can make into food, clothing, and weapons for mankind, so that mankind can live and flourish. He saw the way, saw what was expected of him. No, he contradicted her. That is not why we steal. We live on what we steal, but we do not steal just to go on living. Why? she asked blandly as if she didn't know the answer better than any other member of the tribe. Why do we steal? What is more important than survival? Here it was now, the catechism. To hit back at the monsters, he began, to drive them from the planet if we can, regain earth for mankind if we can, but above all, hit back at the monsters. He plowed through the long verbal ritual, pausing at the end of each part, so that the record-keeper could ask the proper question and initiate the next sequence. She tried to trip him once. She reversed the order of the fifth and sixth questions. Instead of, What will we do with the monsters when we have regained the earth from them? she asked. Why can't we use the monsters' own alien science to fight the monsters? Carried along by mental habit, Eric was well into the passage, beginning, We will keep them as our ancestors kept all strange animals in a place called a zoo, or we will drive them into our burrows and force them to live as we have lived, before he realized the switch and stopped in confusion. Then he got a grip on himself, sought the right answer in his memory with calmness, as his uncle's wives had schooled him to do, and began again. There are three reasons why we cannot ever use alien science, he recited, holding up his hand with the thumb and little finger closed. Alien science is non-human. Alien science is inhuman. Alien science is anti-human. First, since it is non-human, he closed his forefinger, we cannot use it because we can never understand it. And because it is inhuman, we would never want to use it even if we could understand it. And because it is anti-human and can only be used to hurt and damage mankind, we would not be able to use it so long as we remain human ourselves. Alien science is the opposite of ancestor science in every way, ugly instead of beautiful, hurtful instead of helpful. When we die... Alien science would not bring us to the world of our ancestors, but to another world full of monsters. All in all, it went very well, despite the trap into which he had almost fallen. But he couldn't help remembering the conversation with his uncle in the other burrow. As his mouth reeled off the familiar words and concepts, his mind kept wondering how the two fitted together. His uncle was alien science, and, according to his uncle, so had been his parents. Did that make them non-human, inhuman, or anti-human? And what did it make him? He knew his religious duty well. He should at this moment be telling all mankind about his uncle's horrible secret. The whole subject was far too complicated for someone with his limited experience. When he had completed the lengthy catechism, Rita, the record-keeper, said, And this is what you say about the science of our ancestors. Now we will find out what the science of our ancestors says about you. She signaled over her shoulder without turning her head, and two young girls, female apprentices, 
pulled forward the large record machine which was the very center of the tribe's religious life. They stepped back, both smiling shyly and encouragingly at Eric the Only. He knew the smiles meant little more than simple best wishes from apprentices of one sex to apprentices of the other, but even that was quite a bit at the moment. It meant that he was much closer to full status than they. It meant that, in the opinion of unprejudiced, disinterested observers, his examination was proceeding very well indeed. Singleton, he thought fiercely to himself. I'll show them what a singleton can do. Rita, the record-keeper, turned a knob at the top of the squat machine, and it began to hum. She flung her arms up, quiveringly apart, and all, warriors, women, children, apprentices, and even the chief himself, all bowed their heads. "'Hearken to the words of our ancestors,' she chanted. "'Watch closely the spectacle of their great achievements. When their end was upon them, and they knew that only we, their descendants, might regain the earth they had lost, they made this machine for the future generations of mankind as a guide to the science that once had been and must be again." The old woman lowered her arms. Simultaneously heads went up all over the burrow and stared expectantly at the wall opposite the record machine, waiting for the magic message. "'Eric the Only!' Rita called, spinning the dial on the left of the machine with one hand, and stabbing at it randomly with the forefinger of the other. This is the sequence in the science of our ancestors that speaks to you alone. This is the appointed vision under which you will live and die. He stared at the wall, breathing hard. Now he would find out what his life was to be about. Now. His uncle's vision at this moment years ago had suggested the nickname he came to bear, the Trap Smasher. At the last initiation ceremony, a youth had called forth a sequence in which two enormous airborne vehicles of the ancestors had collided. They tried to cheer the boy up, but he'd known his fate was upon him. Sure enough, he had been caught by a monster in the middle of his theft and dashed to pieces against a wall. Even then, Eric decided, he'd rather have that kind of a sequence than the awful emptiness of a blank vision. When, every once in a while, the machine went on and showed nothing but a blinding white rectangle, the whole tribe knew that the youth being examined had no possibility of manhood in him at all. And the machine was never wrong. A boy who'd drawn a blank vision inevitably became more and more effeminate as he grew older, without ever going out on his theft. He tended to shun the company of warriors, and to ask the women for minor tasks to perform. The machine of the ancestors looked at a boy and told exactly what he was, and what he would become. It had been great, that science which had produced this machine, no doubt about it. There was a power source in it which was self-contained, and which was supposed to be like the power behind all things. It would run almost forever, if the machine were not tampered with, although who could dream of tampering with it? In its visions were locked not only the secrets of every individual human being, but enormous mysteries which the whole of mankind had to solve before it could work out its salvation through the rituals and powers of the ancestral science. Now, however, there was only one small part of mankind that concerned Eric. Himself. His future. He waited, growing more and more tense as the power hum from the machine increased in pitch. And suddenly there was a grunt of awe from the entire burrow of people as a vision was thrown upon the wall. He hadn't drawn a blank. That was the most important thing. He had been given an authentic ancestral vision. 
Scanner goods done it again, a voice blared, as the picture projected on the wall showed people coming from all directions, wearing the strange body wrappings of the ancestors. They rushed, men, women, children, from the four corners of the glittering screen to some strange structure in the center and disappeared into its entrance. More and more poured in, more and more kept materializing at the edges and scrambling toward the structure in the center. Scatter goods done it again, the vision yelled out at them. The sale of sales, the value of values. Only at Scatter Goods three stores tomorrow. Binoculars, tape recorders, cameras, all at tremendous reductions, many below cost. Value, value, value. Now the vision showed only objects, strange, unfamiliar objects, such as the ancestors used. And as each object appeared, the voice recited a charm over it. Powerful and ancient magic, this, the forgotten lore of ancestor science. Craft Yarman exposure meters, the best there is. You've heard about them, and now you can buy them. The light meter that's an eye-opener. A price to fit every pocketbook, $8.95. Tomorrow at Scatter Goods, absolutely only one to a customer. Koyoto automatic 8 millimeter movie cameras with an f1.4 lens and an electric eye that does all the focusing and gives you the perfect exposure every single time as low as three dollars a week the supply is limited so hurry 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 eric watched the sequence unfold his hands squeezing each other his eyes almost distended in reverence and concentration. This was the clue to his life, to what he might become. This was the sequence that the record machine of the ancestors, turned on at random, had vouchsafed as prophecy of his future. All knowledge was in that machine, and no possibility of error. But Eric was getting worried. The vision was so strange. Sometimes there would be a vision that baffled even the wisest women, and that would mean the youth who had called it forth would always be a puzzle to himself and all of mankind. Let it not happen to him. Oh, ancestors, oh, science, oh, record machine, let it not happen to him. Let him only have a clear and definite vision so that his personality would be clear and definite for the rest of his life. "'Our special imported high-power precision binoculars,' the voice roared on as a man appeared in the vision and brought one of the strange objects to his eyes. "'If we told you the manufacturer's name, you'd recognize it immediately. Seven by fifty, only fourteen dollars and ninety-five cents, with case. Ten by fifty, only fifteen dollars and ninety-five cents, with case.' You see farther, you see clearer, you pay less. You always pay less at scatter goods. Rock bottom prices, skyscraper values. Tomorrow, tomorrow, tomorrow at scatter goods annual week after Halloween sale. There was a click as the vision went off abruptly to be replaced by a white rectangle on the wall of the burrow. Eric realized that this was all the clue there was to be to his life. What did it mean? Could it be interpreted? Anxiously, now, he turned to Otil, the chieftain's first wife. He turned to her as everyone else in mankind was now turning. Sarah the sickness healer and Rita the record keeper amongst them. Only Otil could read a vision. Only short, squat, imperious Oteil, the chieftain's first wife, was her title of honor and her latest title. But long before she had acquired that, long before even she had become head of the female society, she had been Oteil the Augur, Oteil the Omen Teller, Oteil, who could walk in her mind from the homely burrow of the present into the dark labyrinthine corridors of the future. Otil, who could read signs, 
Oteil, who could announce portents. It was as Oteil the Augur that she could pick out the one newborn babe in a litter of three that had to be destroyed because, in some way or other, it would one day bring death to its people. It was Oteil the Augur that, upon the death of the old chief, she had chosen Franklin, the father of many thieves, to take over the leadership of mankind, since he stimulated the most propitious omens. In everything she had been right. And now, once again, it was as Otil the Augur that she threw her arms over her head and twisted and swayed and moaned as she sought deep inside herself for the meaning of Eric's vision. It was as Otil the Augur, and not as Otil the chieftain's first wife, for that she had only been since Franklin had ascended the throne mound. The scratches and holes gouged in his body by Sarah the sickness healer had begun to ache badly, but Eric shrugged off their annoyance. Could his vision be interpreted? And how would it be interpreted? Whatever Otil saw in the vision would stick to him for the rest of his life, much closer than the dried blood upon his arms and legs and chest. How could you possibly interpret such a vision? Eric the Scattergood? That was meaningless. Eric the Value? No, that was a little better, but it was dreadfully vague, almost as bad as a blank vision. He stared past Otil's writhing figure to where his uncle stood, surrounded by his band a little to the left of the throne mound. Thomas the Trap Smasher was watching Otil and grinning with all his teeth. What did he find so funny? Eric wondered desperately. Was there nothing holy to him? Didn't he realize how important it was to Eric's future that his vision be readable, that he get a name to be proud of? What was funny in Otil's agony as she gave birth to Eric's future? He realized that Otil was beginning to make coherent sounds. He strained his ears to listen. This was it, who he really was, who he would be for all his life. Three times, Otil mumbled in a voice that steadily grew clearer and louder, three times our ancestors gave Eric his name. Three repetitions they made. Three different ways they called on him to become what their science needed him to be. And all of you heard it, and I heard it, and Eric heard it too. Which, Eric puzzled, which among the many strange magical statements had contained his name and his life's work? He waited for the auger to come out of it. He had almost given up breathing. Her body relaxed now her hands hanging at her sides. Otil was speaking to them in a sharp, authoritative voice as she stared at the wall of the burrow where the vision had appeared. A light meter that's an eye-opener, the ancestor science said, she reminded them. And an electric eye that does all the focusing. And you see further, you see clearer, you pay less. The record machine told us of Eric. What the ancestors want of Eric is unmistakable. What he must be if we are to hit back at the monsters and regain the earth which is rightfully ours. Thank the record machine. Thank each and every ancestor. At least the message had been unmistakable. But what precisely had it been? Otil the Augur, the Omen Teller, turned to face him now where he stood apart from the rest of the eagerly watching mankind. He straightened up and stood stiffly to learn his fate. Eric, she said. Eric the Only. Eric the Singleton. You go out now to make your theft. If you are successful and return alive, you will become a man. And as a man you will no longer be Eric the Only, you will be Eric the I, Eric the I, Eric the Aspire, Eric who seeks out the path for mankind. 
Eric, who hits back at the monsters with his eye, his open eye, his electric eye, his further seeing, clearer seeing, less paying eye. For this is the word of the ancestors, and all of you have heard it. At last Eric took a deep breath, and he did so now, noisily, in common with the whole of mankind, who had been hanging on O'Teal's words. Eric, the eye, that was what he was to be, if he was successful and if he lived. Eric the eye, Eric the aspire. Now he knew about himself. It was fixed and for all time. It was a good name to bear, a fine personality to have. He had been very fortunate. Rita, the record-keeper, and her daughter, Harriet, the history-teller, rolled the record-machine back into its accustomed holy place, the niche in the wall behind the throne-mound. Despite the sacred quality of the act in which she was engaged, the younger woman could not take her eyes off Eric. He was a person of consequence now, or at least would be when he returned. Other young and mating-aged women, he noticed, were looking at him the same way. He began to walk around in a little circle before mankind, and as he walked, he strutted. He waited until O'Teal, no longer the augur now, no longer the omen-teller, but once more the chieftain's first wife, he waited until she had returned to her place at the head of the female society, before he began to sing. He threw back his head, and spread out his arms, and danced proudly, stamping before mankind. He spun around in great dizzying circles, and leaped in the air, and came down with wrenching spasmodic twists of his legs and arms. And as he danced, he sang. He sang out of the pride that racked his chest like a soul, coughing out of the majesty of the warrior that was to be, out of his sure knowledge of self and he sang his promise to his fellows. I am Eric the Eye, Eric the Open Eye, Eric the Electric Eye, Eric the Further Seeing, Clearer Seeing, Less Paying Eye, Eric the Aspire, Eric who finds and points out the way. Are you lost in a strange place? I will show you the path to your home. Does your burrow break off in too many branches? I will pick out the best one, and mankind shall walk through it safely. Are there enemies about, hidden traps, unthought of dangers? I will see them, and give warning of them in time. I will walk at the head of the line of warriors, and see for them. For they shall be confident, and they shall conquer. For they have Eric the Aspire to lead the way, and point the path. So he sang as he danced before mankind under the enormous glow-lamps of its great central burrow. He sang of his mission in life as just a few short Auld Lang Syne's ago he had heard Roy the Runner, at his initiation, sing of the fleetness and swiftness that he would soon be the master of, as his Uncle Thomas had sung long ago before that of his coming ability to detect and dismantle traps as once his own father had sung of the robberies he was to commit, of the storerooms he would empty for the benefit of mankind. He sang, and he leaped, and he whirled, and all the while the watching host of mankind beat time with its feet and hands, and played chorus in the litany of his triumph. Then came a loud grunt from Franklin the father of many thieves. The noise stopped. Eric danced to a quivering halt, his body wet all over, his limbs still trembling. "'That is what is to be,' Franklin pointed out, once the theft has been made. But first, first comes the theft. Always before manhood comes the theft. Now let us speak of your theft. I will go into the very home of the monsters, Eric announced proudly, his head thrown back before the chief. I will go into their home alone, with no companion but my own weapons, as a warrior should. I will steal from them, no matter what the danger, no matter what the threat. 
and what I steal I will bring back for the use and enjoyment of mankind. Franklin nodded and made the formal reply. That is good, and it is spoken like a warrior. What do you promise to steal from the monsters? For your first theft must be a promise made in advance and kept, kept exactly. Now they were at it. Eric glanced at his uncle for support. Thomas the Trap Smasher was staring off in a different direction. Eric licked his lips. Well, maybe it wouldn't be too bad. After all, a youth going off on his first theft had complete freedom of choice. I promise to make my theft in the third category, he said, his voice trembling just a little. The results were much more than he had anticipated. Franklin, the father of many thieves, yelped sharply. He leaped off the royal mound and stood gaping at Eric for a while. His great belly and fat arms quivered with disbelief. The third category, did you say? The third? Eric, thoroughly frightened now, nodded. Franklin turned to Chief Wife Otiel. They both peered through the ranks of mankind to where Thomas the Trap Smasher stood in the midst of his band, seemingly unconcerned by the sensation that had just been created. "'What is this, Thomas?' the chief demanded, all ceremony and formality gone from his speech. "'What are you trying to pull? What's this third category stuff you're up to?' Thomas the Trap Smasher turned a bland eye upon him. "'What am I up to? I'm not up to a damn thing. The boy's got a right to pick his category. If he wants to steal in the third category, well, that's his business. What have I got to do with it?' The chief stared at him for a few moments longer. Then he swung back to Eric and said shortly, "'All right, you've chosen. The third category it is. Now let's get on with the feast.' Somehow it was all spoiled for Eric. The initiation feast that preceded a first theft, how he had looked forward to it. But he was apparently involved in something going on in mankind, something dangerous and unsavory. The chief obviously considered him an important factor in whatever difficulty had arisen. Usually an initiate about to depart on a theft was the focus of all conversation as mankind ate in its central burrow the women squatting on one side, the men on the other, the children at the far ends where light was dim. But at this meal the chief made only the most necessary ritual remarks to Eric. His eyes kept wandering from him to Thomas the Trap Smasher. Once in a while Franklin's eyes met those of Otiel, his favorite and first wife, across the feast that had been spread the length of the burrow. He seemed to be saying something to her, although neither of them moved their lips. Then they would nod at each other and look back to Eric's uncle. The rest of mankind became aware of the strained atmosphere. There was little of the usual laughter and gaiety of an initiation feast. The Trap Smasher's band had pulled in tightly all around him. Most of them were not even bothering to eat, but sat watchful and alert. Other band captains, men like Stephen the Strong-Armed and Harold the Hurler, had worried looks on their faces as if they were calculating highly complex problems. Even the children were remarkably quiet. They served the food over which the women had said charms much earlier, then scurried to their places and ate with wide eyes aimed at their elders. All in all, Eric was distinctly relieved when Franklin, the father of many thieves, belched commandingly, stretched, and lay back on the floor of the burrow. In a few minutes he was asleep, snoring loudly. Night had officially begun. End of Chapter 2